I met Ruben Castaneda covering a homicide in the early 1990s. He was a police reporter at the Washington Post, and I worked the night shift at Channel 9. Years later, he called me with a confession. He was a crack addict and an alcoholic, and he was planning to write about it. It feels like it's been two or three lifetimes that have passed since I was out here. This street was really a, a combat zone. <laughs> DC uh, today is dramatically different from the way it was. Uh, there were shots fired, so as you can imagine, it was chaos. I think they'd be amazed at how lawless and violent many of these neighborhoods were. Much of Ruben Castaneda's life played out here, on S Street Northwest. I lived a reckless and dangerous double life. Back then, in the late 1980s and early 90s, it was a lawless combat zone. An automatic gunfire ring out. Stained by bloody turf wars and rampant crack sales. And they seemed to be there 24-7, seven, seven days a week. I know because I made buys. Then, a respected Washington Post police reporter working nights, Reuben returned to the streets after his shift to score crack for himself. The greatest physical feeling you've ever felt, multiply that 100,000 times and that might come close. His lust for crack drew him to a DC apartment where a man he dubbed Big Man yanked him by the collar and thrust him up against a wall. Big Man's friend went to get a weapon. I thought it, it could be a knife or a gun. If it was a knife, I thought I was in for some torture. I thought a gun at least would be quick. He escaped, but continued his tumble into drug-induced despair as wasted nights melded into a blur of mornings. And come the morning, the money's all gone, and I realized what an awful thing I'd done to myself. Remarkably, Reuben lived to tell his story. He's been clean for more than 22 years and has written S Street Rising about his own redemption and the renaissance of a neighborhood. I'd say that was the worst version of me, and now I try to be the best version of myself. It's worth noting that Reuben credits the Washington Post, his former employer, with playing a critical role in his survival. It was a Post editor who first took him to rehab. Andrea McCarran, WUSA 9. Get back. Keep moving. Like pop, pop, pop. It was chaotic, and I see a, a gill laying down on the ground, and I saw somebody trying to revive them, revive a, a guy. Frightened carnival revelers were sent running down Georgia Avenue after police say more than 25 shots were fired at this corner, less than 25 yards from all the carnival foot traffic. In total, four people were shot. Three of them, according to police, had nothing to do with whatever led up to the gunfire. We believe that um, that the victims um, were innocent bystanders when gunfire erupted. The shooting forced police to shut down Georgia Avenue around Gresham for hours. Investigators say whoever was responsible for the gunfire got away, prompting a helicopter to be called in to keep an eye out from the skies. Even D.C.'s mayor, Vincent Gray, showed up to the scene. People here were left rattled after seeing the violence. When I heard the shots, that's when I just got out of the way and got down. D.C. police say the shooting isn't being linked to the carnival, despite how close it was to the festivities. Well, it's just a shame because, unfortunately, you know, some of these blocks throughout here, you know, are kind of our crew... Um, hot areas. But despite that fact, some are fearing this act of violence may tarnish the reputation of D.C.'s annual Caribbean Carnival. Yeah, it definitely puts uh, the whole celebration in a negative light, and it's unfortunate because there are so few kind of big events that we have here in D.C. as a, you know, cultural events, um, especially in the African American communities. All right, gents, uh, 
we good to go? Go, 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 go. Hold right, clear left, hold right. By day, they're special agents with Homeland Security Investigations. But on a moment's notice, they suit up and serve high-risk arrest warrants, dismantle drug rings, and bring sex traffickers and human smugglers to justice. It's kind of like going into the phone booth and put it on the cape, and then out they come, and they're, and they're ready. We clear this side. This side clear. Training like this is critical. Today, they may be working a drug case. They may be working a fraud case. They may be working a sexual predator case. But at a moment's notice, they're going to get a phone call, and they may suddenly find themselves in a situation where they have to rescue somebody or to really cover an undercover agent in a very dangerous situation. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Why do you have a gun? In one of the training scenarios, this reporter played the unenviable role of an undercover agent whose interaction with a drug dealer takes a dangerous turn. Put the gun down! Help! Help! After making an urgent distress call, I wait to be saved. It is the longest minute of my life. For the undercover agent and the, or the person that's uh, in trouble, uh, it seems forever. The, the clock is ticking very slowly and it just doesn't happen quickly. From the team standpoint, uh, it was a very quick action. Uh, they went in perfectly, and the timing was just right from the time that they got the in initial distress call to the time that the undercover agent was brought out. Uh, it was very quick. You do not need to bring a gun out here. We play out a similar scenario in a parked car. Again, the deal goes bad. Help! 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 Put the gun down! Show me your hands! Show me your hands! Go, 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 go! Do it now! Get down! Get down! Our team moved in uh, to take the uh, appropriate action to rescue, save, keep from harm the undercover agent, and then also arrest the subject. Ready to extract! Ready! Extract! In, in this situation, you don't have a lot of time to make a decision. It has to be automatic. Police alert! Police alert! Start team coming out! It has the adrenaline pump drama of a Hollywood movie, but this is real work and life and death situations. And ultimately what you want is everyone to be safe. You want everyone coming home at the end of the night. In Loudoun County, Virginia, Andrea McCarran, WUSA 9. The deadliest campus shooting in U.S. history. 6 7 Sandy Hook School. Caller is indicating she thinks there's someone shooting in the building. This is a horrible event. More than two dozen people killed. Beyond the headlines and hysteria. <laughs> in rural Pennsylvania. Kutztown has been thrust into the national spotlight. Now we're stuck in the middle of a national gun debate that we didn't ask for. Kutztown University, with its 10,000 students, is now a campus divided. Why do you need guns at school? School is supposed to be somewhere where you can be safe. I do feel a little safer knowing that there's somebody here trained with a gun that could stop a madman before the police show up. I'm a pro-gun individual, but I do believe there are some instances where guns should be prohibited, and I think an educational setting like this is one of those circumstances. Let's just say everywhere that I'm legally allowed to carry a firearm, I do so. Now, when students like Robert Falstick slings his backpack over his shoulder, he's carrying more than books. He's packing a Smith & Wesson. Why? Um, because it's my constitutional right as an American. It's my right as a Pennsylvanian. And realistically, uh, the best way to defend yourself effectively is with a firearm. Kutztown is one of seven state-owned universities to adopt the gun policy. All weapons must be legally registered, and the permit holders must be 21. The policy allows gun owners to carry concealed weapons outdoors or in their cars, but not in academic buildings, residence halls, or at school athletic events. If you can't bring it into the buildings or bring it out your car, what's the point of having them? 
to say that it's going to be an issue and oh no we're going to have you know wild west style shootouts on the campus that's that's erroneous and even even laughable when things get polarized right they get dangerous a polarized campus may be the least of their worries the sudden gun debate has led to some mysterious threats against a faculty member the first note said drop the gun issue or else there was a second note under his door right it says what do you fear more guns or death Kutztown is not alone. Other public institutions have made similar moves to abide by the law and comply with the Second Amendment. The, the game has changed, and the game has changed for the positive for people that would be safer. In Kutztown, Pennsylvania, Andrea McCarran, WUSA 9. On the day that we met Ryan, he'd promised his mother and himself that he'd detox. But hours after taking a prescription that was supposed to ease the gut-wrenching symptoms of withdrawal, he was in a motel room, determined to get high. Is there anything I could have said or done to stop you? No. Once I had the dope and everything, there was no stopping. Addiction is a, the devil, it's a disease from hell. In a random motel room, far from the million dollar home where Ryan grew up, the devil is winning. And you sure you want to do that? Yeah, I'm going to. I already have a mindset to it, I'm going to do it one more time. He's had a year of one more times. Each fix is never his last. I just want to get high. I thought this was going to be the detox. Yeah, but I mean, I got money, so I'm going to get high one more time. Ryan makes a promise he just can't keep. And once I'm done, break all my needles, throw them away, throw all my paraphernalia away. And you're saving this for later? Yeah. Moments later, he's neatly storing his needles and remaining drugs in a desk drawer. This is my stuff for later. Just one year ago, Ryan was hooked on painkillers. But OxyContin became too hard to find. He still remembers the first time heroin soared through his veins. It was the best feeling in the world. Like, I felt like I had arrived. Now, he's at a dead end. Once I'm high and well, the hours just go by so quick. But when I'm not high and I'm sick and trying to get something, every minute feels like an hour. Ryan is a master manipulator, convincing his mother to pay for this two-night motel stay. But most evenings, his lanky body wanders into a local hospital for a few safe hours of rest. I stay in the maternity ward. There's just, you walk in and there's a whole bunch of chairs and couches and and a TV that pe people stay there all the time because they're waiting for babies to be born. What you looking for? Cigarette. 21 and unemployed, Ryan needs at least $60 a day for his half gram fix. I don't want to get high anymore. I just can't stop. He stole from his family, so his parents threw him out. Now, he shoplifts from home improvement stores and sells his loot or the gift cards he gets when he's allowed to return items without a receipt. If I don't have the money, I'm finding ways to get money. Stealing? Yep. From family? Family, friends, anybody that I can manipulate. Ryan will do anything to avoid going through withdrawal. You're very restless and antsy. You cannot sit still. You feel like you want to crawl out of your skin. It isn't withdrawal now. The smell of dope makes me puke. But the rancid smell of heroin that hurdles Ryan into uncontrollable vomiting. But still, he wants it in his veins. I just feel like the lowest person on the earth. I was sitting in the mall and watching in the movie theater, like when I'm at the hospital and just look at people and be like, man, this is what normal people do. On the path toward normalcy, 
Ryan's life has been a patchwork of stints in detox and rehab and failed stays at halfway houses. I don't feel like doing this anymore. I'm tired of it. As the sun sets on another monotonous day. I just numb myself so much to the point where I can't even cry. Despair comes to stay for the night. You're going to stay alive out here, aren't you? Yeah, I'm going to keep fighting because I know this will pass soon enough. Ryan's family has already spent more than $70,000 in private rehab facilities. The longest program was three months, and afterwards, Ryan went right back to feeding his addiction. His family cannot get him insurance because of his pre-existing condition. Andrea McCarran, WUSA 9.